Good morning. And welcome to today's service. Um, we have another glorious day, and I think uh, it's probably safe to say that uh, summer's finally gotten here. Um, may still have some cloudy days, but hopefully the afternoons will always be clear. Um, just a few announcements. Um, there are earphones for those who would like to hear us better, I guess. Um, also, uh, the Santa Barbara Jail still needs some clothes, uh, uh, blue jeans, um, tennis shoes, shoes, uh, and if you can bring them and leave them in the office, that'd be appreciated. Also, uh, we have in the foyer is the sign-up sheet for the um, JACC picnic that's coming up on the 23rd. So if you're planning to go, uh, please sign up so that they will know. Uh, one other thing today, um, also, uh, we are having communion. It's not in the bulletin, today's bulletin, but um, we are having communion, and that will be after the uh, praise and worship time. Um, we also still have the list of all the people that, congregants that uh, need prayer, can use prayer, and that would be appreciated. Um, is there any, okay, Sugumi? Well, good morning. Um, I'd like to uh, request a prayer for uh, Mariko Sensei's uh, father and Mariko and Mariko's uh, family in Japan. Uh, some of you might know Mariko Sensei's father has been in, um, ill and been hospitalized quite some time. And um, Mariko Sensei has been sending us a text message, uh, as means uh, Nichigo uh, Bible study group uh, once a week or a little more than once a week. And then the last message came Friday, said um, uh, the family visited uh, uh, Mariko Sensei's father, and then uh, his condition is not as good as they thought. So um, um, Mariko Sensei used to worry a lot, and since they are, they are away from um, home, then all of a sudden they went, and then, then you know, all of a sudden the father's condition was not as good. So play, uh, please pray for father, uh, Mariko Sensei's father, to uh, gain strength, and then um, um, having family will give him extra strength. And then also Mariko Sensei's family um, will have a um, um, good vacation in Japan. Um, one thing in Japan, visiting hospital is still re uh, restricted. Like 50 minutes a week, um, even by family. So uh, the family um, uh, don't get to see fa uh, Marco Sensei's father um, as often as they want. So um, anyway, uh, please uh, pray for Mariko Sensei, Mariko Sensei's father, and the family gonna have a, a good, meaningful, uh, memorable vacation in Japan. Jan and I want to thank you for your prayers for us. We had a great time up at Mount Hermon, and I think Bob and Agnes did too. And uh, Bob and I are still uh, fierce competitors in the archery range, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Very refreshing physically, mentally, spiritually, and so I'll share more about it uh, next time I preach. But uh, Derek is up north with family today uh you know his aunt recently passed away so please keep derek in your prayers and he's also going to be going to japan 
July 19th until the end of August, and Utica's baby is scheduled for C-section delivery July 21st. And so please keep them in your prayers. And also got a text, two texts this morning with prayer requests, one from Brian Tari. You saw on the program that he was supposed to play piano today, but he fell last night at a, or he was playing at another uh, uh, venue and fell and had to go to emergency and get stitches. And so he's, he would like prayer for healing. And then uh, Tammy Roman found out she has strep throat. So uh, Ter Tammy and Eric will not be here today, but want to pray for them as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there anybody else? I know. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I just wanted to add, for anybody that's going to the JACC picnic, they would like us to bring either a dessert or rice, right? A rice dish. Onigiri. Something rice. Anyway, um, would you please let me know so we can tell them? I know not a whole lot of us are going to be there, but if you could let me know about those two items. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Is there anyone else? <laughs> okay. Um, if you'll join me in prayer then. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we just give thanks and praise to you this morning um, for another wonderful day. and. The fact that we can sit here and join together and worship and praise you, Lord. Um, please bless today's service. Uh, we have a guest speaker. Um, really shouldn't call him really a guest because he has been here so often and has served you so well here at Bethany, um, Pastor Steve Jolly. Father, um, we're just so blessed to have this house of worship. Uh, and it's been here for over 100 years. And uh, we just lift our church up to you. Uh, please continue to bless it as you have in the past. And we hopefully for uh, the future. Father, we lift up to you our, our church leadership, our pastors, Chuck, Derek, and Mariko Sensei. Uh, please continue to be with them as they lead our congregation in each of their respective areas. Father, uh, we lift up to you also at this time, um, Mariko Sensei, especially with her father's illness, and we just ask that you be with her and her family, and please give strength and healing to her father. Um, it was good news a few weeks ago, but it has gone a little bit backwards, so we just ask that you uh, lift him up strengthen him and heal him. Um, Father, we continue to um, lift up to you the Ramabai Mukti mission. Father, they have served you so well for over 130 years and it's been, they've been continuing to expand and we just ask your blessing upon them. Uh, give them the emotional and physical strength to continue to serve you in that area and continue to expand and reach out to even more in that, that country. Father, we lift up to you those who are in need of your strength and healing and uplifting. You know who they are and what their needs are. And we just thank and praise you for how you have done, what you have done for so many of them. Um, we have mom, Bobby Kono, uh, Sagumi and her friends. We have um, Lloyd Henning. We have Tammy, uh, please heal her from her illness, uh, give her strength, um, ease her pain from the uh, illness, and um, just be with her and her family. Uh, so many have received your benefit here, Lord, and we just lift all of them up to you, and we give thanks and praise to you for what you have done for them. We also lift up to you our prodigal sons and daughters, uh, 
they are where they are, but we just ask that you be with them. Um, continue to guide them and uh, lead them back to you, Lord. Uh, we ask that uh, not only for our prodigal sons and daughters, but also for our, our country and worldwide, Lord. Uh, there has never been a greater need for your presence to be with us in these times. So, Father, we just give thanks to you for those things. Um, Father, we also give thanks to you for the tithes and offerings that we receive and that we use to continue to spread your word, not only here within our family, but also elsewhere, that the financial needs we can uh, provide uh, continue to spread your word, your words of comfort, healing, and all the things that you do for us. Um, so we just give thanks in, for these tithes and offerings. Father, <clears throat> we just continue to praise and worship you. Father, um, I'll just read the Lord's Prayer. You know it, but our, our congregation can repeat it. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. In your name we pray, amen. At this time, if you'd like to uh, rise and greet each other, uh, then we'll follow with the praise and worship. Ohio goes, I'm us, and good morning, and if you can please stand and join us in worship, we will start with In the Secret Place, because so we want to hear the Lord's voice today, and we want to see him and know him more deeply, so In the Secret Secret in the quiet place, in the stillness you are there, in the secret, in the quiet hour I wait only for you, cause I want to know you. I want to know you, Lord. I want 
want to know you. I want to hear. I want to hear your voice. I want to know you more. I want to touch you. I want to touch you. I want to see your face. I want to know you more. I want to know you. I want to hear your voice. I want to know you more. I want to touch you. I want to see. Sang the second verse, right? Yeah, we did. <laughs> Off in、uh, worship land. How great is our God! Serve a great and awesome God. 
and we want to prepare our hearts for communion. Let's sing, come to the table in Japanese and then in English. gift of salvation, for your grace and your mercy, for pouring out your life on the cross for us, paying the sin debt that we owed, and rising again, conquering death. We praise you, Lord, and we remember you today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated, and we will have communion now. Our communion is open to everyone who's confessed the Lord Jesus as Savior. And you don't need to be a member of Bethany Church in order to take partake in communion with us. And again today, uh, we have the two cups for communion. So take both uh, the top and bottom cup with the juice and the bread underneath, and then we'll partake together. So if the... Uh, Ushers can come forward, then we'll pass out the elements, and then we will partake together.
in Matthew 26, 26, it says, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take and eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let's pray. Lord, we observe this ceremony to remember you and to thank you for what you did for us. Back 2,000 years ago when you celebrated Passover with the disciples and initiated this communion service, the Lord's Supper. Lord, thank you again for what you did for us, offering your body as the perfect Passover lamb. Lord, we remember you now, and we praise and worship you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So the Lord Jesus said at the beginning of the meal, take and eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Please take the bread. And after they had eaten their meal, Jesus took the cup. And he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Shu yesu wa ko iwarimashita. Kono sakazuki wa watashi no chi ni yoru atarashi keyaku desu. Kori wo nomu tabi ni watashi wo oboe nasai. So let's remember the Lord's new covenant of forgiveness by faith. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the gift of salvation. And thank you that we can celebrate forgiveness for our sins. We can celebrate eternal life. Oh, Lord, we just pray your anointing upon Pastor Steve today as he shares from your word. We pray, Lord, that you would prepare our hearts and use this time to bring us closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And who's reading scripture? Is that you, Greg? Okay. Today's scripture reading is Psalms uh, chapter 20, 32. Um, but before I read that, uh, I'd be remiss if um, <laughs> my nerves got the, uh, the better of me. Uh, if you'd join me in a quick prayer um, of those that, uh, of our family that I forgot. Dear Heavenly Father, please be with Derek and his family as they go through this uh, loss. Um, uplift them, and just strengthen all of them through this trying time. Father, I also lift up to you, Derek and Utica, uh, as they are preparing for the birth of their child later on this month. Um, Father, just be with them both and give them strength and uplifting, and may the child be healthy and <clears throat> everything go well. Father, we just lift them both up to you as um, leaders of our church, and uh, we just want them to have a safe time in Japan, and uh, we'll welcome them back when they come back. And Father, we also lift up to you Brian, who uh, had a fall and uh, hurt his hand, and we just ask for healing upon him. Um, so Father, we just include uh, if there's others that I have forgotten, Lord, forgive me and uh, just keep them in mind also. So, uh, Father, just bless this service as we uh, will be hearing from Steve, Pastor Steve, later. Um, 
So I just ask your blessing upon this service, blessing upon all the congregates and all those that are attending us with us uh, through the internet. So in your name I pray, amen. Okay, the reading is from Psalms 32. <clears throat> Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my inequity. I said, I will confess, confess my transgression, transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad. You righteous, sing all you who are upright in heart. May the Lord bless his reading. open, if you would, to Psalm 32 as we work our way through this passage. It's a familiar passage to many, uh, one of the most famous of the Psalms, um, and I hope it's uh, not overly repetitive, but encouraging to each and every one of you. So whenever you um, go on a mountain climb, if you're a mountain climber, you come to what's called the crux, C-R-U-X, and so Maybe you've seen pictures of uh, famous mountain climbers on great big mountains, and there's one spot that they come to that is the most difficult move, and if they can get past that, then they are usually have smooth sailing all the way up. You can even think of them in terms of uh, maybe if you go on a hike, and you go up some mountains and down some mountains and up some mountains and down some mountains, and finally you come to the last mountain that you need to get over to go to where you're going, and you look at that and you realize that is the crux. That is the most difficult part of your journey. Well, today we're going to come to a passage that describes the crux of the Christian life. Uh, we're going to come to a psalm that addresses what is the greatest problem, the most difficult problem in the Christian life. And if we get past this problem, if we understand what the psalm has to say about the crux of our problem, in all likelihood, we will have relatively smooth sailing in our Christian life. So Psalm 51 and Psalm 32 are undoubtedly the two most famous psalms in the uh, Old Testament. They are penitential psalms. They're psalms of repentance and confession of sin. And, and Craig just read it for us. Uh, you were in the English Standard Version, I believe. Yeah, and I, I'm going to be reading a little bit more out of the New International Version and even some references to the New Living Translation because they, they bring it out in such graphic way. Uh, these Psalms in Psalm 32 are personal. They're emotional. They're experiential. Sometimes I run into my non-Christian friends and they say, oh, the Bible, the Bible's so boring. It's, it's just an old book and it doesn't really have anything to say to me. Well, I, I, I want to just challenge that. Here we come to a very, very personal section of Scripture you can read and feel the psalmist's anguish, his anxiety, his affliction. I mean, this is dramatic stuff. We can kind of sit here on a Sunday morning and read it and go, oh, yeah, I've heard that before. 
but I want you to enter into the fact that this is really, really important. I'm going to divide our passage up in four sections. So if you're taking notes, just so um, you know where I'm going, we're going to look at the promise, the problem, the personal example, and then praise. Again, the promise, the problem, a personal example, and then we'll end with praise. So point number one, the promise in verses one or two. Uh, We should start where the psalm starts, and the psalmist says, blessed. The New Living Translation says, oh, what joy. The message says, count yourself lucky. How happy you must be. So the psalm wastes no time in telling us what brings spiritual happiness, and what is it? Pure and simple, it's forgiveness, forgiveness from our sins. For living a full and joyful life, there is nothing like being forgiven. Every once in a while, I'll be in a small group Bible study, and people will say, what do you like best about being a Christian? I mean, there's a lot of aspects to being a Christian and living the Christian life. And I always say, I love being forgiven. I love the freedom that comes with my sins being forgiven. So there we see at the very beginning the promise, blessedness, happiness, joy to those of us who can grasp and get a hold of this forgiveness. Point number two is the problem. Verses one and two and verse five, uh, the psalm perf- is perfectly clear that the crux of our, of our life, the biggest problem we have is to overcome this sin. Now, sin, that word in the minds of many modern people, brings either a laugh or a shudder, doesn't it? Uh, When I talk to my non-Christian friends and use the category sin, they act like I'm speaking a different language. They hardly even know what I'm talking about. And sin is used in so many funny ways in our culture. I was watching TV the other night, and uh, some advertisement came on for a chocolate dessert, and it said it is sinfully delicious. I thought, that's a funny way to use that word. Um, Let's just eat it and enjoy it, okay? But it was sinfully delicious. But when the word is used more seriously, modern people in our town, in Santa Barbara and Goleta, they tend to shudder. Sin is a word that seems antiquated, unused, doesn't make a lot of sense, And in a culture that's having a hard time figuring out right from wrong, well, sin becomes kind of a nonsense word. But the psalm helps us understand the crux of the problem by using three different Hebrew words. I want you to look at your Bibles and and see how they're translated. These, These are three different Hebrew words. The first is transgression. And transgression means rebelliousness or self-assertion or nobody can tell me what to do, especially God. And so that's transgression. The next word for sin, the Hebrew word, it means to, to go off the path, to maybe get off the trail, to take the wrong road, to get lost. And then the next word for sin is a different Hebrew word, and it means quite simply to disrespect God. St. Augustine, the fourth century um, uh, theologian and pastor, uh, wrote famously his confessions where he talked about his own spiritual journey. And he reflected on his life as a teenager when he and some of his teenager friends broke into a pear orchard. And they went and they stole all these pears and they, they threw them. They were being bad teenage boys and they, they ate some, but mostly they just threw them around. They just created havoc. And years later, Augustine reflected on, why did I do that? Why did I break into this pear orchard and create havoc? I don't even like pears. And he reflected and said, the reason I did it is because it was forbidden. In other words, I did it just because somebody told me I shouldn't do it. And so in his rebelliousness, this idea that nobody can tell me what to do, Augustine destroyed the pears. Sin is to go off the path, to get lost in the woods. A couple of years ago, my wife and I went to New Zealand, and uh, New Zealand is a beautiful, beautiful country, and there's only one thing wrong with New Zealand. They drive on the wrong side of the road. (laughs) Now, I'd never done that, and uh, we got our little rental car, and we got out of the airport, and uh, I want to tell you, it just about ended my marriage. 
This summer, I'll be married 50 years, but uh, a year ago in New Zealand, it just about ended it because for about three days, it's really difficult to drive on the wrong side of the road after you've spent your whole life driving on what we believe is the correct side of the road. And I was off in the weeds, and I was almost hitting things, and my wife is yelling at me. It was a very, very difficult moment. This is something like what the psalmist is talking about. When sin gets a hold of our life, it's like going off into the weeds. It's getting off the road. It's becoming rebellious. Now, this is really, really important. So I want you to hear this. Sin in the Bible is not doing a few bad things. Oh, I stole some cookies. Or I said a bad word. That's not what sin is. Sin is not just breaking a couple of rules. Sin is not just making a, a mistake. Whoops, I made a mistake. I, oh, I broke that dish, or I didn't, was, I didn't pick up after myself. That's, that's not what sin is. Sin is not just, it may include this, but sin is not just about feeling guilty. That's not what sin is. But rather, sin, from a biblical perspective, is a deep-seated rebellion from God's authority in our life. And a recognition that this rebellion blocks a joyful life, a forgiven life with God. I, I was so pleased, Craig, a few minutes ago when you prayed uh, for wayward young people. And um, certainly I know a lot in, in our church of uh, folks, younger folks who have either left the faith or so marginalized their faith that it doesn't mean much. And it's a problem, and we need to pray about it, and we need to engage uh, younger people that, that seem at times to be leaving. But I think one of the key problems with younger people who maybe are rejecting their faith, especially if they grew up in the church, is they have an inad inadequate understanding of sin. That sin, they might have been taught growing up, is just doing some bad things, rather than understanding its rebellion in our heart from God's authority. C.S. Lewis puts it this way. Christianity, C.S. Lewis says, tells people to repent and promises them forgiveness. It therefore has nothing, as far as I know, to say to people who don't know they need forgiveness. So a lot of my non-Christian friends they really don't have a sense that they need forgiveness. Lewis goes on, he says, a man who admits no guilt can accept no forgiveness. So we live in a culture that just has a very difficult time naming it, right? It's just really hard for people in our cultural moment, whether they're young or old, to just say, yeah, I'm in rebellion from the authority of God. So uh, I, I don't know where anybody here is in this room politically, and I'm going to use a little Donald Trump uh, illustration, but it's not a political statement, so I don't care if you like Donald Trump or don't. That's not the point, so be gentle with me here, okay? But he, he makes my point that I'm trying to make here in the Psalms so well. So a few years ago, Donald Trump, when he was president, was interviewed by Anderson Cooper on CNN. And Anderson Cooper uh, asked him if he ever sought forgiveness from God. So I'm going to read Donald Trump's response to that question. Have you ever sought forgiveness from God? And he said, I'm not sure I have. I just go on and try to do a better job from there. I don't think so. And then Anderson Cooper pressed him a little more. And President Trump said, I think repenting is terrific. If I make a mistake, yeah, I think it's great but I try not to make mistakes. I mean, why do I have to, you know, repent? Why do I have to ask for forgiveness if you're not making mistakes? I work hard. I'm an honorable person. Shortly thereafter, he was interviewed by a Christian um, interviewer, uh, Cal Thomas, and Cal Thomas was asking him the same question, and Trump responded this way, I will be asking for, for, for forgiveness but hopefully I won't have to be asking for much forgiveness. In other words, I really haven't done that much wrong. Again, I'm not making a political statement, but Trump's response is how many, many people in our culture think about sin. I'm not that bad. I try pretty hard. 
And if I need a little forgiveness, it'll probably just be a little forgiveness because I'm not that bad. I'll ask for it. And some of you right now might be tweeting in your heart, I don't need a lot of forgiveness. I just, I just need a little bit. Well, a lot of my non-Christian friends think that God grades on a curve. And they look around and they go, well, I'm better than him. I'm better than her. God must think I'm fine. And it's a completely wrong misunderstanding of sin. Most of us do not want to release our spiritual tax records, do we? We don't want other people seeing that. Yet we know something's wrong. We know something's wrong out there. All we have to do is turn on the the news. And we also know, when we really think about it, that something's wrong in here. David says unambiguously in verse 5, would you look at it? Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord. That was the turning point in David's life. And after his his sexual sin with Bathsheba and the murder that followed that, that horrible event in Psalm 51, David says, I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. In other words, it's right there. I can see it. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Everybody knows that all 12-step groups, whether it's for for alcohol addiction or drug addiction or pornography or what it is, the beginning for all 12-step groups is admitting that you need help. And this is the great discovery that David made in his relationship with God. I um, Sometimes when I take the Lord's Supper... You know, I'll, I'll, churches all do it differently, and it's just such a privilege to take the Lord's Supper with you this morning and re- be reminded of God's grace in our life. Uh, at our church, uh, we tend to come forward. So the elements are forward, and there's a couple of aisles, and, and people come while music is being played. And I've, I've just had the, the most enjoyable time in my life of, of I'll pray for a little bit, and uh, then I'll just kind of watch people come to take the bread and the wine and I just look, oh, there's another one. There's another one. There's another sinner. There's another rebellious person. And then I finally get up and go with my wife, and I confess, my heart's rebellious. I, I'm prone to want to go my own way. I don't like God's authority in my life because I'm self-centered and autonomous. And it's, I, I just love the Lord's Supper that puts all believers at this equal level of needing God's grace and forgiveness. Do you know that God is quicker to forgive your sin than we are to confess it? That's true. God is quicker to want to forgive your sin than we are to confess our guilt. Verse 2, blessed is the person in whose spirit there is no deceit. This is the person who stops hiding and owns up to his or her sin and repents honestly. Proverbs says, 28, 13, people who conceal their sins will not prosper, but if they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. So we've seen the the promise at the very first verse, the problem, and now thirdly, let's just take a look for a moment at a personal example in the Psalms. And this is where The Psalms are so wonderful because indeed they are so personal. In vivid and emotional language, David describes what it was like when he hid from God. And you don't have to answer me out loud. I just wonder how many people here can resonate with this. He said, my bones wasted away. There was groaning, that, that deep sense of something wrong. There was a heavy hand upon him. He says, my strength dried up like on a hot summer day when there's just no energy. There was a time in David's life when he kept quiet about his rebellion from God. He just didn't want to look at it. He didn't want to acknowledge it. And finally, when he did, it changed everything in his life. The Bible always presents the weight of sin as too much to bear. This rebellion from God. Think, th- think at the very beginning of the Bible. Genesis 3 and 4. Uh, Adam and Eve, what do they do after sin comes into their life? What's the first thing they do? They hide. 
They run and they hide from God because their, their, their relationship with God had been fractured. Genesis chapter 4, Cain kills his brother Abel and he cries out in chapter 4, verse 13 of Genesis, my guilt is too much to bear. It's too heavy. And relief only came when he confessed and repented of his sin in the psalm. You know, we tend to make a lot of excuses, don't we, about our sin? Well, if you had a father like I had, if you grew up in the home that I grew up in, Steve, I, grew, I had a really difficult time. I grew up in a really rough neighborhood. Steve, I really never felt love from my parents. Steve, I really try hard to be a good person. These are lies that we tell ourselves. The weight of unconfessed sin is a horrible burden. August 1998, Mike Turner was a pastor who'd been on a sabbatical, and he was going to end up his three-month sabbatical by doing a 10-day backpack in the Wind River Range of Wyoming. A very experienced backpacker. He went on a, a solo trip to end his sabbatical from his church. And during that trip, he was in a big rock field, uh, kind of going up a mountain, and a very, very large boulder dislodged and pinned both his legs so he wasn't going anywhere. But he was fully alive, and while in pain and the rest, he had his backpack, and he had some food and water and uh, some stuff to keep him warm, and he had a diary, and he began to write in this diary, and he, had, he entered the journal for 10 days, and then the journal stopped, and he died. But he was describing in that journal what it was like to be fully alive, to be perfectly cognizant of his surroundings, even enjoying the beauty while trapped of the world that he was looking at, but having a burden that he was unable to get that rock off his leg, trapped, alive, but not free, held down by a weight he couldn't move. That's what sin is like. Do you know what the most read book in the Western world has been historically? It's the Bible. The, you know what the second most read book is? Anybody can come up with this? Pilgrim's Progress. Pilgrim's Progress, until it's hard to know what these statistics in the, in the last, say, 80 or 90 years when there's been more and more books published. But up until that point, the second most widely read book after the Bible in the West was Pilgrim's Progress. Pilgrim's Progress was written by John Bunyan in the 17th century. And it's a wonderful, wonderful allegory. 1678. And John Bunyan wrote this, this allegory of the Christian life. And the main character in the allegory is Christian. That's his name. And he's on a journey. And he's on a journey to the celestial city, which is heaven. And there's this, this wonderful section in, in this allegory where Bunyan depicts the Christian life. Let me read it to you. He says, he, that's Christian, ran to a place ascending the hill where a cross stood. So he's Christian and his journey is running up this hill to a cross that he sees. He's not sure exactly what it is. And a little bit below the cross, down the hill at the bottom, was a sepulcher or a tomb. And so I, he says, so I saw in my dream, this is an allegory in a dream, that just as Christian came up to the cross, his burden loosed from his shoulders. Now, all through this allegory to this point, Christian's burden has been this giant backpack that he's carrying around everywhere. And if you've ever had a heavy backpack on, you know, after a while, it's like, oh my gosh, I got to get rid of this thing. And so we're halfway through the book, this allegory, and Christian has had all kinds of experiences and he's been all kinds of places, but he can't get rid of his burden. And he comes up this hill and as he came to the cross, the burden loosened from his shoulders, fell off his back, and began to tumble. So it continued to do so until it came to the mouth of the tomb where it fell in, and I saw it no more. Now that's Bunyan's way of describing the burden of carrying sin, coming to the cross, and then that 
cross and God's grace loosening that sin so that the burden, this backpack that is symbolic of his sin, falls off, tumbles down the hill, and gets lost in the tomb. Is that a great picture of the Christian life? If you ever read Pilgrim's Progress, I would encourage you to do so. In the allegory, the crux of Christian's problem is dealt with at the foot of the cross, and now he's free to carry on without carrying that horrible backpack, that horrible burden of his sin. Psalm 32 teaches us this morning that spiritual freedom and joy come when we confess and repent and accept forgiveness. No more burden. Uh, We need to vector in on one more important part of this psalm. Uh, Guilt feelings and regrets in life, while real, are not the same as confession and repentance. Let Let me say that again so I'm not misunderstood. Guilt feelings and regrets in life, while they are real, I'm not making light of them, they're not the same thing as confession and repentance. Freedom from guilt requires embracing it and having it dealt with by the mercy of God at the foot of the cross. God does not forgive us because he wants to be lenient. He forgives us because his justice has been satisfied. This is really important. God does not forgive us because he's just nice or he's lenient or he wants us to have a good day. He forgives us because his justice, his righteous justice has been satisfied on the cross. 1 John 1.9, one of the more famous verses about forgiveness, John says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and what? Just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you see it? He is just to forgive our sins. God does not forgive our sins because he wants to be lenient. He forgives our sins because his justice has been satisfied on the cross. So today we've looked at a psalm that addresses the crux of the problem of the Christian life. The crux is that thorny problem of our sin and our rebellion. And just like climbing a mountain or going on a hike, when we come to the crux of the problem it can almost seem impossible to get past. Some of you are way ahead of me, uh, and you know that there's a play on words in this teaching. Crux, C-R-U-X in Latin, means literally cross. And so how do we get through the crux problem in life? By the crux or the cross of Christ. Lastly, We've looked at the promise, we've looked at the problem, we've seen one personal example. Last point is verse 11, and this will be done. The psalmist says, rejoice in the Lord and be glad. Your righteousness, sing all you who are upright in heart. The English Standard Version says, shout. If you understand this psalm, if if you've gotten a hold of the, the teaching of the last couple of minutes, that the solution to our biggest problem in life, the crux problem in life that we'll face is done away with because of the cross of Christ. You can't help but sing. This is why Christians sing. Where else in our culture do we sing? I want you to think about it. Uh, Don and I were in um, Slovenia the other day, (laughs) last week, and... uh, No, 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 it's Croatia, excuse me. We're in Croatia and Slovenia. And in Croatia, we were in this beautiful, beautiful little town. And there was all kinds of um, people in soccer jerseys, young, old, men, women, and they all were the same. And I couldn't tell what soccer jersey it was. And let me tell you, they were having a big party. Well, they were from Denmark. And that night, there was a big game between Denmark and Croatia. Really big game, big deal. And... uh, One of these guys, I went up and I said, what country are you from? And they they were having just a great time. And he he said, come to this bar with us. And I'm like, oh, I don't know. And uh, so my wife and I did. And we went to this bar restaurant type thing. There must have been 500 people, every single one of them in the same uh, soccer jersey from Denmark. And what do you think they were doing besides drinking a lot? Singing. 
singing, and one guy would start, I'm, I'm talking hundreds of people, one guy would start a song, and they'd sing, and they'd jump up and down, and they'd clap, and it'd kind of go quiet for a minute, and another guy would start a song. And I asked, what are, what are you, why are you singing so much? And I, it was a guy had a great answer. He looked at me in his broken English, and he says, we're singing because we're happy. Why do Christians sing? Because we're happy. And we can't help but sing. There's very few places in our culture where we sing, but oh, I love to sing with God's people because there's a sense that God has so changed my life and so gotten rid of that, that burden on my back and, and brought me into spiritual freedom that now I can sing and rejoice in him. Let's pray. God, thank you for this greatest of all gifts, the forgiveness of our sins. We thank you, Christ, that you uh, paid the penalty, that you brought your justice to bear for our rebellion on the cross. God, for anybody who is here this morning and has a difficult time uh, admitting or coming to grips with their own rebellion, I would encourage you to, God, dive into their hearts and bring them to a place where they can say, oh yeah, me too. Against you and you only have I sinned. And then God, help us to enjoy the tremendous freedom that we have that we're past the most difficult part and the biggest question of life. And because of that forgiveness and freedom that we have in you, we can walk in joy and newness of life and we can sing. Amen. Yeah, thank you, Steve. And we would like to respond by singing praise to the Lord and remembering how much we were created to praise the Lord. I was made to praise you. If you'd like to stand and sing with us, we will sing uh, the first verse in Japanese and then two verses in English. Chance to fail. 
praise, worship at your feet, and I'll obey you, Lord. I was made for you. You were made for him, made to sit at his feet in worship and enjoy him forever because he loves you and me. That's our doxology. Okay. Uh, he loves you. would just like to read from Ephesians Ephesians 3 now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please join us for fellowship in the courtyard and uh, welcome Pastor Steve. <laughs> 